Um, our next speaker is Dave Williams. Um, Dave is uh, a faculty member in the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center. He is, where is Dave's, oh, there we go. Uh, he's the only one that's been in the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center as long as me. <laughs> because um, the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center started um, and Dave and I were the inaugural members, I think, of, with, uh, and a, a number of people that aren't here anymore. Um, Dave has a lot of types of expertise. He's going to lead a symposium today talking about some of the comorbid symptoms that are common in pain, especially in nosoplastic pain. Dave? Thanks, Dan. Um, so yes, we're going to have a symposium. We have a number of speakers that are going to be joining us uh, for the symposium. We are going to be talking about symptoms uh, and domains that are associated with nosoplastic pain. So historically, we've tried to understand pain uh, by categorizing it uh, so that we can understand what it is, how we might want to treat it. And we've had a number of classifications over the years. Now, sometimes we classify it by time, either acute or chronic. Sometimes we classify it. Uh, by body location, is it head pain, back pain, knee pain, hip pain, uh, assuming that maybe the pain is different depending upon the body part that it's coming from. We've also classified it based on uh, disease entities, so rheumatic pain or cancer pain or sickle cell pain, assuming that the pain uh, differs by these different uh, diseases. A more, a more current way of looking at this is by classification by mechanism. And the International Association for the Study of Pain has developed uh, three kind of me mechanistic classifications for pain. And these would be uh, nociceptive, neuropathic, and nosoplastic. So nociceptive pain is, is kind of pain uh, at working the way we think it should work. Uh, telling us about a threat to our, our body. This can be a mechanical threat, a thermal threat, a chemical threat. Uh, usually there's inflammation, some type of damage. This type of pain is usually well localized, and it's usually uh, the, the amount of pain is consistent with the amount of, of damage that, that has occurred. Uh, the, this type of pain is typically treated uh, with NSAIDs, can be treated uh, with uh, uh, various types of injections or surgery. Um, and classic examples would be OA uh, of, of the knee, uh, uh, autoimmune disorders, cancer pain, injury, things like that. The second classification is uh, uh, neuropathic pain. And this can be either uh, neuropathic pain of the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. Uh, this is not pain working the way it's supposed to. This is a disorder. And there's uh, usually some type of damage or entrapment uh, of the nerves. These, the distribution tends to follow the dermatomes. Uh, patients will often report feeling kind of a tingling or a numbness. And these tend to be responsive to locally targeted uh, therapies for the nerves. Uh, this could be, again, surgery, could be injections or CNS acting uh, drugs. And classic examples uh, would be diabetic neuropathy, sciatica, carpal tunnel, post-stroke pain, things like that. The last category uh, is the newest one, and this is nosoplastic pain. And nosoplastic pain is uh, the central nervous system augmenting uh, either peripheral uh, nociception or generating a, a more central form of pain. Uh, this type of pain is not well localized. It's usually widespread in nature. And there tends to be an association of, of other CNS-mediated symptoms. This type of pain is usually disproportionate to an observable injury uh, and oftentimes, there's, there is a history of other pain conditions uh, when this is, is uh, seen. This tends to respond to CNS acting uh, medications and non-pharmacological interventions. And classic examples would be fibromyalgia and the chronic overlapping pain conditions. So chronic overlapping pain conditions, uh, again, kind of thought to be 
uh, the types of pain where nosoplastic pain is the primary driver. Uh, this was a term that was coined in, in 2013. And you can see the various pain conditions that are, 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 uh, can be labeled as chronic overlapping pain conditions. This listing may not be exhaustive, but it is the 10 that we are currently looking at right now. And you can see that by the numbers, this tends to uh, incorporate about half of the chronic pain cases that you're likely to see. This type of pain uh, tends to disproportionately occur in females. And the, the nature of the overlap, you can have overlap uh, of, of any of these conditions. Uh, sometimes you have just two overlapping, sometimes you may have more overlapping. Usually the more overlapping that you see, uh, the kind of worse prognosis for, for the individual. So one question that has, has arisen is, if, can you only have one COPC or, or do you always see them in combination? Uh, this question was addressed by the, the MAP network that was setting interstitial cystitis. Uh, so by, by the name, it's inflammation of the bladder. And we looked at about 400 people uh, who had the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis and gave them body maps. And so they were instructed to draw where they felt the pain. And what you can see is that around a quarter, maybe 25%, drew the body map that you see over on the left and where, where it was confined. It was well localized. It was just in the bladder. The other 75% either had um, pain outside the bladder, maybe in, in adjacent reasons, or in the case of some, headaches, or as you see on the far right, where much of the body is being, being, driven, uh, being drawn, suggesting more of a widespread presentation. So what this suggests is that there may be some individuals that do have one of the chronic overlapping pain conditions, uh, but it is, is looking and it's having characteristics of more of, the, of a nociceptive type of, of pain presentation as opposed to the widespread presentation that we would expect to see in nosoplastic pain. This same study uh, was, was run in other populations, uh, Sean Mackey's group, did a very similar study and, uh, in chronic migraine, and Drew Sturgeon, who is here, is one of the authors on, on this, this paper. Uh, they looked at about 1,600 individuals with chronic migraine, and you can see the same type of pattern. 29% just had migraine, just had one, one area on the body map drawn, whereas there was an additional 70% 70, uh, 70 or so that looked more like the widespread pain. There was another uh, group that looked at mixed chronic pain in a very large sample of around 9,000 uh, patients. And again, you see kind of that 25% having just a single area, a very focalized uh, concern, versus the 75% that are again displaying more of this chronic widespread presentation. So this is a paper that Dan Claw was an author on, uh, published in Lancet just a couple of years ago, describing nosoplastic pain. And as you see in the highlighted section, the widespreadness is a cardinal feature of widespread, uh, of, of nosoplastic pain. But notice that there's also these other symptoms that tend to go along with it. Uh, symptoms such as fatigue, sleep, memory problems, and mood problems. These are also part of that uh, constellation of characteristics that are associated with nosoplastic pain. So the, the question is, what is the role of these other symptoms? Uh, are, are these other symptoms just kind of like downstream phenomena of having uh, chronic pain, having nosoplastic pain? Are they precursors? If you have these symptoms, are they precursors or, or, or suggesting a vulnerability towards the development of, of nosoplastic pain? Or is it part and parcel? They're kind of intermixed. They basically inter in influence the whole experience of, of, uh, of nosoplastic pain when the person experiences it. To help us answer these questions, oh yeah, here we go. To help us answer these questions, we have an all-star panel. Uh, we'll be addressing each of these uh, symptoms that are, are accompanying 
uh, no subplastic pain. And we will be, each, each speaker will have about 15 minutes or so, and then uh, a, a, about five minutes or so for, for questions af after each, uh, each symptom of nosoplastic pain is addressed. So without further ado, why don't we go ahead and have our first speaker. Our first speaker is Daniel Wibley. Uh, Daniel is uh, here at the University of Michigan, a faculty member in uh, 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 PM&R. Uh, Daniel is also, oops, Daniel is also an honorary lecturer uh, with the University of Aberdeen, and he is currently one of the co-chairs of the uh, Sleep and Pain Special Interest Group uh, with uh, USASP. Uh, so Daniel, it's a pleasure to have, this, have you join us today in addressing the symptom of sleep. Thank you very much. I didn't know I was an all-star, so I'm happy to hear that's the case. <laughs> So this afternoon, I'm going to be providing an overview of some of the things that we know about the sleep of people living with nosoplastic pain, largely relying on data collected from people living with fibromyalgia. I'll then delve into some of the evidence that's delineating the temporal association between sleep and pain. And I'll go on to summarize a range of mechanisms that are thought to underlie the relationship. And I'll conclude by looking at whether improving sleep may help as, uh, as part of a pain management program. But you'll see there's already been some overlap with Tonya's and indeed Dave's talks already today. And I wanted to begin by stating that sleep is not a monolith. It's an active, a complex, and a multifaceted phenomenon. It includes biological, psychological, behavioral, and environmental influences. And reflecting this complexity, there are many approaches to measure and study different aspects of sleep. And this can, you can use either objective or subjective assessment methods. And the gold standard method is overnight in-lab polysomnography. And as a way into the talk today, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Um, as a way in today to, to the talk, and really to help orient all of us, I'm going to provide some basic information about um, sleep and what sleep looks like when we measure it with polysomnography. Um, and that will help us to think about how it might look different with someone who has nosoplastic pain compared to someone who doesn't. Now, the word polysomnography um, comes from Latin, and it translates into many sleep writings. So you can see you get these multiple writings out of a night of recording. And these are obtained by measuring eye movements, muscle activity, brain waves, and cardiorespiratory function. Now, the many sleep writings produced allow us to, to obtain insights into the architecture of somebody's sleep. So the microarchitectural features shown here in these many sleep writings can be summarized in a graphic called a hypnogram, where we can differentiate different phases of sleep and the time spent in these different phases. So I've created a caricature hypnogram here um, so, so that you can see that you're able to detect the sleep period um, between the time you turn the lights off and the time you turn the lights on when you wake up. And within this time, there's time spent awake, time spent in rapid eye movement sleep, the period during which we predominantly dream, and then the time in non-REM sleep, with stage one sleep being light and delving down to stage three sleep, which is deeper, or slow wave sleep. So you'll see from this hypnogram that we cycle through different parts of the cycle throughout the night with more deep sleep early on and lighter sleep later. And there are a number of different features that can be distinguished from the hypnogram. So sleep onset latency is the time it takes to transition from being awake to falling asleep. Wake after sleep onset is the amount of time you spent awake after you initially fall asleep. And total sleep time is self-evident, the amount of time you're asleep, um, which is a combination of the time you spend in both rapid eye movement sleep and non-REM sleep. And from these values, we can calculate an individual sleep efficiency for that night, defined as a total sleep time, divided by the total amount of time spent in bed, both awake and asleep. So a good night's sleep, as caricatured in the cartoon, can be described by a short sleep onset latency, a small amount of time spent awake after initially falling asleep, and a high sleep efficiency. 
So over 90% sleep efficiency is really good, but we would all hope to have at least 85% sleep efficiency. Now, the hypnogram is essentially a summary of the more detailed information that we get for those, from those many sleep writings. And we can delve deeper into some of those readings to explore some of the micro-architectural features of sleep. So captured using EEG, alpha waves are detected during quiet wakefulness and during the transition to stage one non-REM sleep or light sleep. And these persist until they're replaced by slower theta waves in stage two sleep. And as we transition to stage three sleep, delta waves are evident. And these are slower brain waves with a lower frequency and that's where they, we get the name slow wave sleep. And within non-REM stage two sleep, we see different types of phenomena. So we see K-complexes and sleep spindles. So K-complexes are these waveforms which have this characteristic positive, negative, positive shape. They last around a second. And they can occur spontaneously, but they can also be provoked by um, internal or external stimuli. So internally, maybe respiratory interruptions, or externally, if you're touched or you, you're, you hear noises whilst you're sleeping, you might see the signature. There's, there's still some debate about what their physiological function is, but they are thought to be involved in sleep maintenance by suppressing cortical activity um, in the context of what the brain might perceive as harm, um, harmless stimuli. But they're also thought to be involved in arousal from sleep if the brain inter interprets a signal as potentially dangerous. So the sleep spindles on the right of this slide are bursts of high frequency, these oscillations of neural activity, and they're thought to play a role in sensory processing, which may be very pertinent to people living with chronic pain. So I've summarized some of the features of what sleep might look like generally, but unfortunately for people with nociplastic pain conditions, they may be less likely to experience sleep, which follows textbook examples. At the macro-architectural level, someone living with nociplastic pain is likely to experience more awakenings, so more fragmented sleep, with fewer cycles through the different stages of sleep, and less time spent in both REM and non-REM sleep, including a reduced duration spent in the restorative stage three sleep, that slow-wave sleep, the deeper sleep that we get. So this may include a longer sleep onset latency, a greater WASO, a longer total sleep time, and as a consequence overall, a lower sleep efficiency. And indeed, this has been confirmed in studies from sleep labs with people with fibromyalgia and other chronic overlapping pain conditions. We also see changes in microarchitectural features such as the alpha waves that are typically detected during quiet wakefulness and during the transition to N1 sleep. We actually see these being observed as intruding into the deeper sleep or so wave sleep in people with fibromyalgia, so-called alpha delta sleep. And this, this um, phenomenon is hypothesized to reflect an arousal or awakening state. And this could contribute to the non-restorative sleep that we hear people with fibromyalgia frequently report. Studies have also shown a reduction in the sleep spindles in women with fibromyalgia during their NREM stage two sleep, compared to pain-free women of similar age and comparable mental health status. And overall, these objective indicators of disrupted sleep align with the testimonies of people living with nociplastic pain conditions. So I'm currently working with a team of colleagues in the UK, and we've been conducting a meta-synthesis of qualitative studies which are exploring the experiences of sleep of people diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And this evidence synthesis includes 25 studies representing the perspectives of 565 people. And I'm not going to present all of the results from that today, but I did want to pull out a key theme from the analysis that we've been doing, which is poor sleep quality as a severe symptom of fibromyalgia. And within this theme, study participants described being unable to sleep properly. They felt that their body was betraying them, and it was leading to a sense of helplessness, a lack of control. And this was to the extent that they felt that sleep was an unachievable fantasy. In a study from 2002, our participants said, sleep or lack of it is the worst thing about the condition for me. It's just another way my body has betrayed me. In another study from the same year, another participant said, I don't feel like I can sleep. This is aging me. I can feel it. And in a more recent study from 2021 from Spain, our participant explained that you wake up in the morning already with fatigue that looks like you've been run over by a truck. 
Now, participants in the studies that we had synthesized do align with what we find from the PSG studies. They were having problems with sleep onset and sleep maintenance. And they were also um, reporting frequently um, reduced sleep quality and feeling their sleep wasn't restorative. And this was even when they felt that they were having an adequate sleep duration. They still were feeling like they were waking, feeling unrefreshed. So one participant said, the problem is that when I sleep, I don't sleep. I am sleeping, but it's if I'm awake. So given that we know that sleep is both subjectively and objectively poor when comparing those with and without nociplastic pain conditions, it raises a question which has already been, already been raised today. Is pain causing the sleep problem? Is sleep causing the pain problem? Or is there a common cause for both? And certainly it's possible there may be a common cause due to the shared neurobiology and multiple overlapping circuits in the central nervous system which are regulating both sleep and pain. But the historical view, like really historical, was that um, pain was disrupting sleep. So pain was causing arousal, causing people to have difficulty getting to sleep, and then it would enter people into this uh, vicious cycle of sleep and pain. And indeed, focus groups that I'm conducting now with um, participants, still people still do believe that pain is a really strong cause of their sleep disturbance. However, this directionality was challenged as early as the 1970s by Harvey Moldowski and colleagues, where they were looking at pain-free individuals, and they wanted to see if they disrupted their sleep, if it changed um, their pain outcomes, see if they could actually invoke spontaneous pain or reduce the pain thresholds. And that was indeed found, and multiple studies since that time have replicated those findings. And specifically, that it's when non-REM stage three sleep, that deeper sleep is interrupted, seems to be really important in provoking pain responses. Now, since then, epidemiological investigations have examined indicators of poor sleep as possible predictors of the development of widespread pain at the population level. To provide some brief examples of this, the prospective Hunt cohort study conducted in Norway investigated the association between sleep-related problems and subsequent diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So of over 12,000 women at baseline without a fibromyalgia diagnosis, 327 went on to get a diagnosis within the 10-year follow-up period. And sleep problems were indeed associated with instant fibromyalgia, and a dose-response pattern was observed. So you'll see that compared to, uh, to people that had never had problems having sleep, if you sometimes had problems having sleep, you had a 1.98 increased relative risk of having um, fibromyalgia. And if you often or always had problems sleeping, it was a 3.43 risk. This finding was corroborated by a prospective cohort study conducted in the UK with community-dwelling adults aged 50 years and above. So in this study of 1,792 participants who were pain-free at baseline, 131, so 7.3% of the cohort, went on to develop widespread pain, which was defined according to American College of Rheumatology 1990 criteria for fibromyalgia. And of the factors that were included in a multivariable logistic regression model, these included anxiety, health-related quality of life, and measures of cognitive functioning. Um, the strongest predictor of um, going on to have widespread pain was um, uh, a, um, experiencing non-restorative sleep on a frequent basis with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.9. And in fact, a systematic review was published earlier this year in the journal Rheumatology, and findings from all of the studies that have interrogated this question to date, but there's 20 of them, have included over 200,000 adults. And the authors concluded that sleep-related problems um, were associated with a 1.79-fold higher incidence of chronic pain. And they also looked at people with chronic pain at baseline and found a 2.04-fold higher likelihood of persistent pain in those with sleep-related disturbances. Now, all of this evidence naturally raises questions about underlying mechanisms linking sleep and pain. And there's a full spectrum. I mean, you name it, it's, it's been implicated. Um, you'll see here many different systems and pathways that have been hypothesized and have been examined in both preclinical and clinical studies. So the immune system, melatonin, the opioid system, the monoaminergic system, um, the HPA axis, orexin, endocannabinoids, as well as nitric oxide signaling and adenosine signaling. So this is still very much a fertile, uh, fertile area of research um, with ongoing work being done to really clearly delineate the mechanisms and how they may overlap or impact on one another. 
and um, sex specific differences have been mentioned today and there is research which is coming out now which is showing that actually males look like to have a stronger pathway through the immune pathway and we know historically that amongst women with fibromyalgia and also pain-free women when we're looking at if they're evoking pain there's actually stronger attenuation of descending pain inhibition. So definitely room for more research looking at sex specific differences in these pathways linking sleep and pain. Outside of the sleep lab, looking at more psychosocial type mediators, clinical studies have been applying statistical mediation methods to data collected from human participants, attempting to delineate the role of psychosocial factors on the causal path from sleep to pain. And all this evidence base is currently limited by the cross-sectional nature of much of the investigations. The preliminary findings are supporting theoretical frameworks which posit attentional, emotional and psychological factors as important on the path between sleep and pain. Now, given these insights, it seems sensible to infer that improving sleep would have a beneficial effect on pain outcomes. But clinical trials of interventions to improve sleep with a view to helping treat pain on the whole have produced mild effects at best. And this slide shows uh, forest plots for the effect of the guideline recommended treatment for symptoms of, of insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, on sleep and pain outcomes among people with chronic pain. And we can see that despite large improvements in sleep, the impact on pain is small. And this is provoking research teams to begin to develop interventions that combine sleep improvement interventions with other active interventions, including those that directly target pain, including those that Tonya talked about in her talk opening today. And these are looking at whether simultaneously delivering the interventions components is superior to the sequential delivery. So again, lots of questions still to be answered in this area. But the hope is that there may be additive or synergistic effects when we combine these approaches together. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I'm looking at the time, coming up to 15 minutes. But I would say, as we continue to design um, and conduct longitudinal studies of the Sleep and Pain Association, as well as run clinical trials of interventions that include sleep improvement interventions to manage pain, there's the opportunity to think really carefully about what data we're collecting uh, over multiple time points to really build on this mechanistic evidence base. Um, thinking about the sex-specific effects, but also maybe bringing some of those biological markers out of the lab and into more epidemiological or kind of population-based study. And hopefully that will help shed greater light on the complex and likely intertwined pathways connecting sleep and pain. Thank you for listening. And if you are a USASP member, think about joining our SIG. Thank you. Questions for Daniel? Yeah. Great talk. Um, Thank you. I'm curious, have many studies looked at the differential effect of number of slow wave cycles versus number of REM cycles on the perceived pain relief the following day? So if the person woke up and they had more cycles, I can think of a couple of reasons why mm -hmm. if they had more cycles of REM, yep. they may feel better when they woke up than if they had fewer cycles of REM and uh, give for the same number of slow wave cycles. So has that been kind of like yeah, so the early work with, by Harvey Mordowski was looking at the um, slow wave sleep deprivation, but they also looked at REM deprivation and found that that wasn't as important as evoking pain in these pain-free people. But I would say that there are, some, there are some thinking around that different stages of sleep may relate to different aspects of pain. So the thought is that slow wave sleep may relate more to the somatosensory aspects of pain, and REM might be more related to some of the more emotional aspects of pain. So again, there's still lots still to do to unpick all of that. Other questions? Yeah, so this is about, like was, Tonya was mentioning, improving sleep first before then going on to um, Afton suggesting then use physical therapy or exercise. I think it's a great question. I'm currently working on an intervention where we're actually looking at improving the two together. So kind of in opposition to what Tonya's talking about. But I think really the next step is then to look at sequential interventions too. And I'm also interested in breaking down the interventions. What are the active components? And certainly for different types of people, there may be different types of ordering, which may be more likely. So I'm hoping to build a career off of that. Yeah. Good questions? I have, I have one question, Daniel, about uh, self-report measures we use in general. 
Is there anything that gets at that output in terms of these self-reporting things? Where you see you say when people report these kinds of problems, something about the way they're self-reporting is actually getting closer to that, that really problematic part that Moldas. I'm not aware of any, but I think it's a really good question and a good thing to develop. So you should have a look into it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laura Freylaw. Uh, we to find our next speaker, we, we had to go to the University of Iowa. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Law is uh, the director of, and I'm going to have to get this right, the uh, Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking with us today about uh, multiple uh, sensory modalities. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and I really appreciate that last talk. I had a history two or three years ago of having a nerve um, uh, problem that sent pain down my shoulder into my arm and tingling and numbness. And I got to tell you, sleep was the worst part. I dreaded nighttime. Daytime wasn't so bad, but so sleep is really important. I got to tell you. So I'm here to talk to you about multisensory sensitivity. There's a lot of different terms for this construct. I'll try to describe what some of this construct is and some of the different terminology that's been used and some of the evidence that it may have value relative to pain. So historically, there was this term, uh, central sensitivity syndromes, uh, about 15 years ago, that is really replaced now with chronic overlapping pain conditions. Kind of the same idea of these multiple pain conditions that seem to coexist. Uh, that's really what I'll also be talking about today relative to multisensory sensitivity. I do want to throw out those. There's still a little confusion, it's still evolving, that the term central sensitization is out there. They're not necessarily synonymous with nociplastic pain. Um, you can have central mechanisms that still cause a local effect. Think of referred pain. If you have a heart problem, it refers to, say, shoulder and jaw, not your foot. Right? So you can have localized central mechanisms that are amplifying your pain in a local area, which is a little different than these widespread chronic overlapping pain conditions. Here's another example. You've already seen several uh, today, but here's a paper for, uh, that I think of as a little of a classic paper showing some of these overlapping conditions. Again, saying that it's really common if you have one to have more than one. And as um, Dave Williams pointed out, you can have just one, uh, but really more often than not, you have more than one when you're looking at your patient population. So more recently, we're starting to see evidence that would suggest this construct that I'm referring to as multi-sensory sensitivity can also be generalized sensory sensitivity. Um, that might be another indirect measure that could be used to learn a little more about the CNS processing of these generalized multiple pain condition phenomenon that has been linked to both pain and comorbidities. So what is this? There is not a single clear definition out there yet. I think we are probably going to have one eventually of a consensus statement somewhere, but I would argue that I operationally define it as three or more sensory, non-painful sensory systems that people report having elevated sensitivity to. Again, high or low, you could think of it. If you have a construct like temperature is a construct, you can have a low temperature or a high temperature. We're usually interested in high sensory sensitivity. But I do think there is the other end of the spectrum of a low sensory sensitivity that might be interesting as well. But for the most part, we're mostly talking about high generalized or multi-sensory sensitivity. So some other terms in the literature. I use multi-sensory sensitivity because I was first introduced to this concept from a Will Barger and Cook paper from 2011 that looked at this concept in people with fibromyalgia, showed it to be elevated, whereas it was not elevated in people with rheumatoid arthritis or healthy controls. So that's where I historically got the term. I have been doing a scoping review with my undergraduate student that I picture here, Harper Dunn, and we 
are in the process of doing our one more year review, but um, as of a year ago, we found about 65 papers that have some relation between multisensory sensitivity and a broad um, definition and pain. Early on, our earliest papers we can find dominated by somatosensory amplification. This scale is the Barsky somatosensory amplification scale, was traditionally developed not as a measure of multisensory sensitivity, but if you read the items, they are actually, many of them, really addressing being too hot or cold, not liking certain smells, um, some body sensations that they're particularly sensitive to, et cetera. It was really used as a psychological construct and almost hypochondriasis. Um, but as we look at the, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, we start to see some new terms pop up, a few more studies. And then in a five-year period, 2017 to 2022, a lot more terms are popping up that seem to have similar overlap. Um, again, not really a single one that's super dominant, although sensory hypersensitivity is out there. Not always, though, def um, clarifying that it's multiple sensory sensitivities as opposed to a single sensory sensitivity. So the scoping review that we're still um, finishing up, but as of a year ago, you can see the number of papers that are looking at this construct relative to any form of pain, whether it's a pain population or a measure of pain sensitivity in healthy populations is really starting to explode. So there was just a spattering 20 years ago, and now that each year there's more and more. So my PhD student who finished a year or two ago is Dan Wang. She did a nice series of studies, and we first looked at a data set that I had been collecting for a number of years looking at experimental pain. We used a muscle pain where we infused uh, an acid into the anterior tibialis muscle, and then we also did a number of QST, quantitative sensory testing, um, different modalities and different tests, temporal summation, condition pain modulation, and threshold testing. Not everybody got every one of those. Uh, some of them we added later on. And I had been collecting the somatosensory amplification scale again as part of what I originally thought was part of a psychological battery. And as we looked at it more and more, we're like, this isn't just a psychological. Yes, it correlates with a lot of different negative affect and catastrophizing, but it seemed to have its own unique correlations with what we were seeing. So we chose seven items that were specifically have some sensory, a clear sensory item uh, related to it. And in this uh, study, we found they were healthy adults that we did this on, that we did see those in the highest quartile, so we have Q1, 2, 3, and 4 showing the lowest sensory sensitivity up through the highest sensory sensitivity based on the somatosensory amplification scale, seven items, that those particularly with pressure and mechanical QST, there was a relationship that was not present with heat um, and less present with punctate. So it seemed as though there was uh, a relationship, but particularly with the deep tissue QST, and this is just in healthy adults. So at the time, we were looking around, trying to find a measure that we thought might be better than the somatosensory amplification scale, and there are some different ones out there. The first four listed are ones that we looked at, some traditionally used in autism. It was before I knew about um, generalized sensory sensitivity scale that the MAP studies used, so we followed up and did a correlation with that one later, but we first looked at the first four to see what are we seeing in terms of overlap? What are they measuring that's similar and different? And I just briefly want to mention, we were doing factor analysis and found on the top half what we would call sort of what those instruments were measuring that seemed to be core sensory sensitivity items. They were missing things, though. There was not much for light sensitivity, which is very uh, valuable, particularly in migraine, has been known for decades. Uh, and not as much on the touch and tactile sensory sensitivity. And then a number of those also included a lot of items that we classified as being more coping, the avoidance uh, approaches to the sensory sensitivity, clearly related, but not actually asking just about sensitivity. We chose not to include um, vestibular, 
and dizziness because that has a lot of pathological components itself that we didn't want to confuse, but that could also be a very relevant sensory sensitivity component. So we developed a new um, modified scale. We, we started with the somatosensory amplification scale, got permission from Barsky, who's an emeritus professor in uh, Boston, and he said, sure, go ahead. So we took five of the original items and added seven new ones that tried to hit each of the, what we considered five core domains um, that you can see up here of basically making sure we had some internal sensory sensitivity, visual, hearing, smell, touch, uh, some food texture. And in using this, we did a survey. Of course, it was over COVID, so we were going to do some in-person, but that fell apart. But the survey was still very interesting. Um, and we first started with people who we didn't ask specifically for people with or without pain. We just asked for community samples. So there was a chunk of them who did have pain and many who didn't. So it was a mix of individuals and found that we saw a sex difference in this mixed group of a community sample. Uh, and so set quartile cutoffs that were sex specific quartile cutoffs that then we used in a follow-up study where we recruited people specifically with a pain condition. We targeted people with fibromyalgia, people with migraine, and people with low back pain. But we also asked about a whole number of, of these chronic overlapping pain conditions and any musculoskeletal pain, et cetera. And then we mapped them as whether or not they had on the x-axis, were they um, also healthy controls? Did they have no pain condition? Did they have one or two of these chronic overlapping pain conditions? Did they have two or um, more and fibromyalgia? Because the challenge with fibromyalgia is whether or not they marked back pain or not. By definition, they have to have some core pain, but they may not have marked it as separate because they may have just considered it part of their fibromyalgia. So if they had fibromyalgia, we automatically put them in the third group or fibromyalgia with a number of chronic overlapping pain conditions. So those are the four categories that you're seeing on each of the groups of the Y, of the X axis. The Y axis is the risk, basically, of um, the odds ratio. And we looked at their, their sex-specific quartile relative to quartile two. So quartile two is just average or below. And if they were in quartile one, that's the green, they were much, more, much less likely to have any chronic overlapping pain conditions, particularly those with fibromyalgia. If they were in quartile three, which is just average and up, no difference than quartile two. So that whole middle group was all kind of a wash, no real difference. If they were in quartile four, meaning they had high sex-specific sensory sensitivity, then they had dramatically increased odds of having two or more chronic overlapping pain conditions. So there was a, a, a very strong relationship, both high and low, relative to these multiple pain conditions, that form of nociplastic pain. And there's been similar and consistent results in other studies as well. Um, uh, Andrew here has published a number of papers with the MAP study showing um, uh, very similar results of these increased risk with increased sensory sensitivity. Um, there's a group, Bar Shalita, who has taken a little different approach. Her work is looking at a construct of sensory over-responsiveness, a component of sensory modulation disorder. So taking people who first have a sensory disorder and then looking at how they respond to pain. Um, so it's coming from a little different perspective, but again, seeing similar results where that pain and the sensory modulation and sensory responsiveness seem to be fairly linked. Um, and there are numbers of studies that over the years have looked at migraine but they've generally targeted just photophobia and phonophobia. Um, but there is some increased evidence that there may be also multi-sensory sensitivity and not just sight or sound. Um, but that is my quick um, overview of some of the literature. And I just basically want to 
send you off thinking that sensory sensitivity might be another marker that could be used as an indirect window into the CNS system, um, is looking at how uh, our, our body is processing sensory input that may also be very relevant to pain. And it might be a marker both of risk, but maybe also of resilience. So people have talked about resilience, particularly from a psychological component, but this may be another marker that could be um, of value to consider for a resilience to having chronic overlapping pain conditions. And that is my talk. <laughs> Questions for Laura? Yeah. Hey, I'm curious what your thoughts are about developmental progression Yes, so when you say developmental progression, are you meaning like developmental like adolescent and on that way, or developmental progression as if the construct over time? Uh, thinking about earlier childhood, like where this is like, something that yeah. is an individual trait that Yes, okay, so um, I don't have any direct studies. I have a, a little bit of anecdotal evidence for you. Um, one, I'm working with uh, two colleagues who um, do pediatric and adolescent, and adolescent pain at Iowa, and we're working on a case series where, um, in, in pediatrics we're trying to finalize now. Um, that they separate, they heard me talk, but they had already separately, anecdotally started asking some relevant questions, not exactly any set instrument, but things that they're asking their pediatric and adolescent pain patients about, and they had already noticed separately that they're seeing a link, that those who are very sensitive to touch and light and sound, um, they're treating a little bit differently. Um, suggesting that it is there, potentially, earlier, um, and we don't know exactly how to use this in treatment yet. However, they anecdotally would suggest they don't respond as well to things like TENS, that that sensory input that for some people is very effective may not be as effective. That's what they've noticed. Um, I think it could also be used with CBT and those uh, part of like the pain education model to explain to people that they have maybe a heightened sensory system that it's it's not their fault, right? And we sometimes say it's not just in your head, right? There's another explanation. So I think there's potential for it to be this developmental, um, but we haven't really mapped it over time. If you look at the number of studies, we've only been really studying it for 10 years. So um, I don't know really. I do, when I talk about this, hear people tell me, oh yes, that sounds like my son. Oh, that's my daughter, you know, who, and I have an older daughter who's now 25, but when she was two, I had to move her socks so that the things lined up. I had to cut all the tags out of her pants and shirts. And, um, and she seems like she's a little bit of higher risk for different pain. She doesn't have chronic pain, but things flare up pretty easy for her. But then they also, we can get them calmed down again. But who knows what time will tell? I don't know. But that was a great question. Long answer for really, not really an answer. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned, uh, Migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. There's been an interesting shift in how we talked about migraine sounds today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. the question I have is Do you see that this, is there, are you aware of any evidence where this fluctuates within a person across time? So, do you see that, you know, in the case of somebody with a chronic pain condition, are there periods of time where there are higher sensitivity and all kinds of things? I don't think it's been well studied. Uh, other than migraine. So migraine has shown sensitivities increasing during a migraine attack, right? So we know in migraine that you do become more sensitive to light, more sensitive to sound. Um, it's not as clear in some of the others. I, my guess is that yes, your sensitivity probably can be even heightened further, um, but, but we don't have, I don't, I don't have good time course data on any population to say that would be a great study, um, but I don't have that data. One more question. Okay. Oh. Oh, great talk. Um, what do you think about sensory sensitivity in pain compared to other disorders where pain does not present as overtly like anxiety, depression, uh, even? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like, is it specific to pain or is it just baseline construct that is riding underneath? 
uh, something else that makes these conditions specific? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't think it's a direct link by any means with pain in the sense that I would argue it's probably a risk factor for a number of things. Um, because yes, we see it in a, um, autism spectrum uh, and some studies would suggest there is more pain um, with that group, but whether or not it's related to the sensory sensitivity is not very clear as yet. Um, I don't think we can say having multisensory or having high multisensory sensitivity is an automatic for having pain. But as as Dave mentioned, I think we have we're learning about more and more vulnerabilities, and it may be one more vulnerability that puts you at risk. That would be my opinion. I don't have all the data to support that. So, all right. Great. Thank you. So much, Laura. Uh,